Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Lee Hoffrichter, host of the Crystal Healing Summit, and it is my pleasure today to be interviewing our guest crystal expert, Hibiscus Moon. Hibiscus Moon is a former science department head turned crystal healer and self-proclaimed geo-geek extraordinaire. She's the founder of the Hibiscus Moon Crystal Academy and author of the book, Crystal Grids, How and Why They Work. Welcome Hibiscus Moon and thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Sara Lee, for inviting me. I'm excited to do this. Hey, great. So because of your, um, we all have stories. So I thought it would be great if people don't know you for some reason, um, to, for you to share a little bit about who you are and how you got to where you are now as a crystal powerhouse. Oh my gosh, I've never been called that before. Well, thank you. Um, well, I am just a crystal geek extraordinaire. Like I said, I'm just a supremely passionate and nerdy about crystals and the science behind them, as well as the metaphysics behind how they work. And it's work that I was called to from a very long time ago. I got into the, I was just mesmerized by the beauty of crystals when I was very, very young. But then I grew up and got into science, but I still liked crystals. And I didn't realize that the two actually merged together and fit together like puzzle pieces very, very well. I didn't realize that until my adult years. Um, I was a science department chair at the time and, you know, had like this side thing, like my hobby, metaphysics, you know, going to classes and workshops and things like that, you know, getting Reiki certified and, but, oh, and then I started making connections like, oh, wait, these things go together perfectly. And then it all began in 2007 when I found YouTube. And I think that might've been the first year YouTube began. And there was like a, a community on YouTube. And um, just a, a small metaphysical community, channelers, people into crystals. And I was like, I found my people. This is where I belong. So it was a beautiful community to belong to way back when. <laughs> and um, it, it just really sprang from there. I, I started doing videos of my own and it just really came from there. That's awesome. I love when the paths merge like that. <laughs> so being having your science background, I thought it would be great for you to address and tell us about how crystals actually form. Oh, this is my jam. I love, okay, you're going to have to cut me off if I go on too long about it, but I really like to talk about this kind of stuff. All right. So the truth is, and this is very intriguing, is what crystals do in nature and how they form in nature we have no idea. I've always thought like, oh, wouldn't that be a, a beautiful thing if someone could somehow figure out a way to go down deep and put a camera in a beautiful crystal vug and watch the crystals grow and see how they do it with nobody around. But obviously it's not possible. We haven't been able to do that. So outside the lab, no one has ever watched a crystal grow into existence that we know of anyway. We do it in the lab, but I'm thinking, you know, what happens in a lab, is that necessarily what happens in the earth? We don't know, you know, it could be very different. So from what, I, what we've learned under measured lab conditions, we've learned that crystals grow at many different rates, depending on what type of crystal it is. We do know that lab grown quartz points, which they grow to get the silica out of for electronics and things like that. Um, if they're about like three inches long, um, I don't really have a three inch one nearby. Um, they take a few weeks to grow. So we can only assume that mother nature grows them at the same rate, given the exact same conditions though. So you can't change one variable. So there are many different variables. You can change one thing and the timing can completely change on how long it's gonna take that crystal to grow. Gypsum, um, I'm sure you've seen the Nika caves in Mexico with this huge selenite gypsum crystals. Um, or gypsum crystals, alum crystals, salt crystals, which we're very familiar with, those can grow very quickly, weeks or months, boom, and they're there. Um, and I, many of us have grown these ourselves, you know, with like science experiments, maybe in school or something. So we have firsthand experience with that. But again, this is no assurance that mama earth does it exactly the same way and at the same rate. So it seems that every crystal starts with a supersaturated solution, which is 
that's just a fancy word for water rich in very, very rich in dissolved minerals. And it's gone beyond the point of maximum capacity of holding those minerals. So we call that a solute. So say for example, um, alum in water, that would be the solvent. And it can grow from that, or it can grow from a seed crystal, like a teeny, teeny, tiny little, like the fuel of a crystal, drop it in a super saturated solution and it starts to grow more crystals. That's another experiment that a lot of us are familiar with, or some of us are familiar with, but again, that's when we do it. We don't know what mama earth does. So mm -hmm. this usually, usually with many crystals, you know, um, where there's the seed crystal along with high heat, sometimes high pressure, when it cools is when crystallization happens. And that usually takes place over the span of a few thousand years for surf crystals that are near the surface of the earth to a few million years if they're crystals deeper in the earth, like diamonds. Mm -hmm. Zircon crystals, I don't know if you've heard of the oldest crystal of the earth. So the planet we estimate is 4.6 billion years old. And we've found some, the oldest crystals we know of, that we know of are 4.4 billion years old and they're zircon crystals. So that's almost as old as the earth itself, 4.4 billion years. I mean, just think about it. It's, it's hard to even fathom how that is. And it took that crystal, you know, we don't know how long the crystal took to grow, but we know they're that old and they're dated by um, the elements in them and how they break down. They have half-lives. So by looking at a small part of it and analyzing how much of the element, say uranium, had decayed into lead, then they know how old the crystal is. Mm -hmm. So a seed crystal is usually generated by a chemical reaction between elements that are present. So there can be a high saturation level in say the water with elements or minerals, and that will induce a faster growth rate, but a faster growth rate increases imperfections. So a crystal like this, this beautiful crystal cluster, clear quartz, doesn't have any imperfections. It's gorgeous. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so I'm going to hypothesize that this grew slowly, not super quickly. If it has a lot of damage or natural imperfections in it, then you can assume that it grew very, very quickly. Um, but the quartz crystal lattice, because a crystal is a crystal because its atoms are configured geometrically perfectly in, an, in a lattice. They're not randomly tossed about. They're in this geometric perfection. So a quartz crystal lattice is the atoms, they actually in a quartz will configure themselves in a spiraling tetrahedrons. They form this hexagon. So when you look at a quartz from the apex down, you'll often see the six sides and a hexagon. And so the secret geometry is built into a clear quartz crystal. And that also guides how the energy works in a quartz crystal. It will spiral up the, what we call the center or the axis, the C axis up to the apex of the crystal. So that's why I really like na natural crystals because you know how that crystal grew, you know where its natural apex is, you know where its strongest energy is coming from. So, and by the way, the apex, now you can't see this with the naked eye, there's some ways to determine it um, that I teach, but if you know which way the spiral goes, you know which way the energy goes in that crystal. And it can determine whether that crystal holds a feminine energy, a masculine energy, or both is the direction that the apex spirals in. So other examples of crystal growth that we know of, and again, this is what we think in science, but it's not, say, preface it with, we don't really know, okay? We really don't know. But smoky quartz and amethyst crystals um, form slowly from aqueous solutions. Most crystals like this do that. Rose quartz, which is more of a mass usually, right? We have rose quartz and they're usually a mass. They don't, usually do not grow like this. Um, pink quartz does, but it's very, very rare. Rose quartz forms quickly from this super saturated aqueous igneous sludge. And when I say igneous, that means volcanic origin. So this sludge of volcanic origin and the, the 
quartz crystals grow from that. And they usually grow and cool, you know, they, they cool semi slowly, but not too quick, not too slow. Harder crystals like our gems, like rubies, emeralds, topaz, diamonds, they form deep in the earth at a very high temperature and high pressure, but they take very long to grow. We're talking millions of years again. Softer crystals like pyrite, fluorite, azurite, those form at lower temperatures than say the gems we just mentioned um, and pressures. Garnet, oh, I didn't bring my garnet with me. Um, it's guessed that garnets grow hypothesized, I should say, about one atom layer a year. So that we can't even see with our, we can't even see that with our naked eye, okay? And just to give you context, that's about an inch. So here's a ruler. I don't know if you can see this, an inch. We got an inch right here, okay? About an inch taking over 10 million years to grow for mm -hmm. a garnet. That's amazing, right? And that's its life cycle. What's our life cycle? Like, our life cycle is like a just a little spit in the bucket. It's nothing. It's a gnat. It's nothing. You know, when you think of the life cycle of a garnet. So, and it's not done growing. The sub oh, the subway garnet. Okay, the subway garnet is a nine pound garnet. It's about this big. And it's nearly about six inches in diameter, weighs a lot, very large. So it's beautiful. So imagine how long that took to grow. Amazing. I, I, who knew? I mean, I just, I love, I'm physically attracted to the beauty of crystals, but there's so much more going on that um, I wasn't aware of. Um, do you feel done with that subject, that topic? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now taking all that and, and kind of having a little bit more understanding of the physical makeup of crystals, as we humans evolve, as the planet evolves, as with global warming and all the craziness that's going on in the world, how do you think, if, if at all, that affects or changes the world of crystals? Yes. yes. I, I, okay. Big short answer is yes. <laughs> now let's get into it. So climate change is obvious and evident. Can't deny that. There's been some mega energy shifts impacting not just our earth though, but interestingly, our entire solar system, our entire Milky Way galaxy. Okay. So I think of it on a very grand scale. And then beyond that, you know, there's, there's some um, scientific evidence of that as well, but we'll just stick to our solar system here for a second. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but recently, very, very recently, Neptune's faced, uh, the, the um, astrophysicists physicists are noticing that Neptune has had this dramatic drop in global temperatures, followed by dramatic warming at its South Pole. And you can actually see a picture of this like heat spot on the South Pole and cold everywhere else. And like, what is going on? And it's not the only planet in our solar system. There are all of our bodies, celestial bodies in our solar system are going through these great changes and shifts. And it's, it's the energy changing our solar system is impacting or perhaps evolving maybe. Um, the energetics of our planet, Mama Earth. This, of course, means that Earth's crystal beds are being impacted as well, obviously, right? So keep in mind that crystals respond to energy, and it's one of the things they do really well. So if the energy is changing and shifting on our planet, it only makes sense that the crystals will respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. So do we want to talk about what could be causing these changes, or do you want to? Sure, sure. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So scientists have recently discovered that gamma ray levels reaching our planet, which they've always done, but they've just increased tremendously on a crazy level. And we get, we're getting these bursts of cosmic rays coming from, we suspect, massive supernova, quasars, all sorts of cosmic sources we're surrounded by in space. But I also suspect there's an energetic shift just to change an energy that's happening, you know, not to point to one cosmic event, but just a change happening across our Milky Way galaxy. Um, so 
there's some reasons why our exposure to cosmic rays is on the rise. It could be, well, we're in the middle of a modern grand solar minimum, meaning our sun's in a state of relative minimal activity, fewer sunspots and energy like that. And when our sun's in that state, when it's not in that state of high activity, it creates a very strong protective magnetic field. Well, right now our magnetic field has diminished. So we're getting more, we're not as protected. We don't have that shield like we usually do. Um, Earth's magnetic poles are shifting. I'm sure you've heard about that. And the poles influence the Earth's magnetic field. So when the poles start to shift, again, the highly protective magnetic, magnetic shield becomes weaker. Therefore we have this less protection. Um, it could also be due to now our planet has poles, our sun has poles. Many people don't realize the Milky Way galaxy has poles and those poles have recently reversed. They've shifted. So it could be that. Then a, an area in our Milky Way galaxy where there's, we call it a galactic void. Our solar system isn't sitting still just floating in space. It goes through the Milky Way galaxy, everything does as a wave and around. And we've just gone through this area where there's a void. So the Milky Way as a whole is spinning around a black hole at the center of it. And our sun also travels in a spiral path through the Milky Way galaxy. And it brings all the planets that orbit it along for the ride. And it's just an amazing thing, but we might be going through this like spot in the galaxy where things are just different. The energy is different. So is impact us and our crystals? Yes, and it's happening multiple times. It's impacting our DNA as well. It's also happened multiple times in the past. Evolutionary biologists have known that spontaneous mutations, which is what they think is what causes evolution, occurs at a rate that has a crucial influence on the nature of evolution. And those happen because of heavy cosmic ray impact. Mm -hmm. So we could look at it as a good thing or a bad thing. You know, it all depends on what lens you're viewing that through. But these rays can impact more than just DNA. They spark volcanoes. They um, start earthquakes and other tectonic activity. So here's the crux of what I'm trying to say is that that energy change shifting directly impacts the crystals. And scientists believe that the reason cosmic rays impact tectonic activity is that cosmic ray particles, they actually, when they penetrate the, the Earth's crust and go deeper into the mantle, it thins out the silica-rich magma layer. What grows from that? Quartz crystals and so many other silicates. So as the temperature increases, the energy also increases, meaning the silica-rich magma layer becomes thinner. This is where the crystals are born. So there's been a change in the energy present at an atomic and molecular level. So the shift we may be feeling, some people feel it very, very strongly. The crystals are feeling it as well. Mm. And the word silica, when we talk about that, refers to silicon dioxide. And that's what makes up quartz, which is what quartz is made of. Um, amethyst is just silicon dioxide with an additional inclusion of iron. So it gets the purple hue. So... I should mention that silicates are minerals that have silica in them. So not to sound too nerdy and sciencey. Um, so it could be any mineral that has silica in it. Black tourmaline has silica in it. So these are affected as well. So silicates make up many of our crystals and scientists are giving us this data now that the cosmic rays are directly impacting and thinning out the silica rich magma layer. So impacting the silicates all pointing to the possibility the silicates being the crystals most affected by, by all of this, but not to say that the others aren't as well. And cosmic rays, what that is, is light. And light is electromagnetic frequencies. And what that is, is information. What kind of information? People always ask, well, what kind of information is this? Well, I'm not at the level to discern that, but my higher self knows and your higher self knows and understands and the crystals understand. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that these cosmic rays and they come in at different angles. So different angles of light convey different information. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go off on a tangent here a little <laughs> bit. Okay, so 
the word angle is often confused with the word angel. Mm-hmm. And angels are always depicted with these angles of light, right? Mm-hmm. And what do the angles of light carry? Information. And what do angels bring? Mm-hmm. Information. Mm-hmm. In fact, the word angel means messenger. So this just like gives me goosebumps. Um, so the angles of light are carrying their light encoded frequencies, their information, like new programs and transformative overtones um, that end up presenting themselves as DNA changes. Maybe we can call these upgrades, evolutionary changes, crystal atomic remodeling, meaning that some crystals will be downloading that amazing intel as will some of us, as a being. Mm-hmm. So cosmic rays actually can upgrade and change all matter, including crystals, including our DNA. Mm-hmm. So regarding the DNA, I'm sure some people might be a bit concerned about the thought of that. Like, wait a minute, what are we talking about here? Mutations, what is she saying? So the thought of a change in our DNA can be scary, but I don't feel this is necessarily damaging to our DNA or our crystals. I feel the high frequency cosmic rays are completely different from other synthetic forms of high frequency radiation that, you know, can damage our DNA. This is completely different on a different level. Um, What I'm saying is here is there's a big difference between man created and source created high frequency waves, okay, or rays like going into an MRI machine or an X-ray machine, no bueno. But when we're talking about the high frequency waves created by source, different level of, of completely different level of energy. So you won't find most scientists backing up what I'm saying, but this comes from a deep inner knowing that cosmic rays are source created. And therefore I feel they're flawless, organized information. So if our crystals are changing, we may need to relearn how to interact with them moving forward. And like, if they're changing, then, you know, how we worked with them before might be changing as well. So we might need to spend some more time getting to know them. Like if we feel we've have a collection of crystals and we know them really, really well, spend some more time get rebonding information to convey to you. They might have different information to convey to you. And this may be something we will continually need to do. And I really look forward to that experience. Wow, wow. Well, if one believes that we are all connected, all of that makes sense. Whatever is going on above happens below and affects us. And, you know, it just, we're all connected. So it makes perfect sense. Now, with all of this shifting, evolving, changing, um, and stress of life, there must be some crystals that can assist us right now. And um, I'm hoping that you have a few you can share with us. Yeah, because there's there is a lot of stuff going on, and, and you know we can we can reference it as an overall feeling of stress, uncertainty, anxiety, feeling vulnerable. You know, from the events of 2020 and, and through to now, um, no doubt an increasing of all those things on a global level, right? So I have my two top two crystals for this. One is clear quartz. So I have my clear quartz here with me today. Clear quartz is a great go-to crystal. It's your general all around great crystal to have on hand. It's easy to get, relatively inexpensive if you're just getting like one point um, and great to just have on hand. It's a clarifier, it's an amplifier of energy as well. It can make any other crystal work that you're doing even more effective by amplifying the energy of that crystal. And it can also help you just gain clarity. Like if you need to meditate on something and gain clarity around it, um, meditate with clear quartz crystal. Clear quartz is a great one to have. And I say all the time, if you could only have one crystal, I would say definitely have a piece of clear quartz. You can do just about anything with clear quartz, work with it in any way. And I'm going to say not so much the milky quartz. And I brought this cluster because it shows the difference between a clear quartz and a milky quartz. The clear is going to be much more clarity, higher amplitude than the milky quartz. Okay. Not to say that milky quartz won't work. Yes, it will. But if you have a choice, go with the clear. You want to try to get it as clear as you possibly can. It's okay to have some veils in it, like little imperfections. They all do. But the clearer, 
the better. That's all. The other crystal I would suggest for this is lapidolite. Mm -hmm. And this is a very nice lapidolite. We call this a book because it looks like it has sheets of paper in it, right? Mm -hmm. And lapidolite is a lithium rich mica. So this is mica with a lot of lithium in it. So lapidolite, and it's usually comes in some shade of violet, lavender, sometimes on the mauve side. Lapidolite comes from the Greek word lapidos, which means scales. And you can see where it got that name from its scaly appearance. Um, and this mineral is also known for aiding with emotional healing. You might have heard of medications that have lithium in them for emotional balancing and healing, mood balancing or improving mood, relieving anxiety, um, promoting rest and peaceful sleep. So lapidolite does all of that. It does all of that. So there's a reason they put lithium in these medications. It actually does work at that level. Um, I keep a piece of lapidolite right by my bedside. Um, and it's because of that lithium containing the color mirror, mirrors, also the color mirrors the specific vibrational frequencies, their precise energy. So you can say also kunzite, lapidolite, they actually often grow together and are the two most popular choices actually for mining lithium or for things that we use in the industrial world. Um, so like lithium batteries, you know? So just like lithium can recharge our batteries and our devices, the minerals that contain it can recharge your auric and energetic battery as well. You can look at it that way. That's awesome. Um, so I love those two crystals that you chose and I hope that everybody else um, can get their hands on some clear crystal quartz and lapidolite. They're fairly uh, common ones to, to get and to buy. So, they are. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for the work you're doing in the world. You're a bright light and sharing so much wisdom and um, and information. I, I really appreciate you and, and what you're doing in the world. Oh, thank you so much. It's my total pleasure. Um, I have more crystals to recommend. I actually have a list of top 10 must have crystals. So can I give your listeners um, a way to grab that free top 10 list? Please do. Yes. Okay. So you can go to hibiscusmoon.com forward slash top 10 hibiscusmoon.com forward slash top 10. And you'll get my list of top 10 must have crystals and why I feel that they're a good crystal to have in your collection. And also, I believe you are offering a free download um, to create your own sacred space with crystals e-kit, an e-kit. So you can get that at your website, www.hibiscusmoongift.com. And that will, that will be in the, um, somewhere on this screen, somewhere when I send it out, you'll see that information. So again, Hibiscus, thank you so much. And I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Sarah Lee. This was an absolute pleasure. Oh, great. Take care. You. Yeah.